Oh, yeah, there it went. Okay, yeah, so here we are. Uh, it didn't ask me if I really wanted to do this. Okay, <laughs> hi everybody, this is, this is Joanne, Science Goddess on Twitter, and uh, I'm here with my co-host of Read Science, Jeff Schomeyer, and uh, we are so happy to have Emily Anthes join us again. She joined us back when we first started, so seven years ago, six years ago, whenever she, she had her book, um, Frankenstein's Cat, uh, Cat. I was gonna say guest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Frankenstein's Cat and Emily, um, we're so glad to have you back. Thanks for having me, I'm, I'm happy to be back. So um, you have recently published a book called The Great Indoors, uh, The Surprising Science of How Buildings Shape Our Behavior, Health and Happiness. And uh, it's been a while since you, you wrote a book and this book is full of a lot of research. But before we get started on that, let me read uh, your bio so everybody knows who Emily is. So Emily Anthes is an award-winning science journalist and author. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Wired, and all the other wonderful places. Uh, the science authors tend to have publications. So um, her book, Frankenstein's Cat, explores how biotechnology is shaping the future of animals and was published in March 2013. It was great to talk to you back then about that. So, yeah. So, Jeff, do you want yes. to get us started? I do. I do. This book, this book we'll get into it and will become clear is all about environments and environmental design and buildings and how they affect us, which is a very interesting thing. I loved, I loved all the examples. Now, what you describe in the book in these various situations is what we're learning about building better environments, either home or work, using data-driven results. And this idea of data-driven seems to me a very 21st century thing. So I thought maybe we should begin by describing how we would go about setting up a study that gets us to data-driven conclusions. And I thought I'd be very happy if we wanted to use the Clemson study of hospital operating rooms as an example because I really want to talk more about all of the hospital results too. So if I want to say I need to make, uh, I have $5 million, I need to make a data-driven better operating room. Mm -hmm. What are we going to, to find out about that? Well, so there are a couple of different ways to do projects like that. Um, and they, you know, as is typical, all have their own pluses and minuses. Um, so one thing you could do and that these researchers did was spend a lot of time watching, you know, doing field studies, watching what happens in actual operating rooms, jotting down notes, you know, looking for correlations between, you know, are there more mistakes or more dropped instruments in operating rooms of this size? Um, so that's a field study and the advantage is that it's real world. You're seeing how people actually behave in these environments. Um, the disadvantage is that it's not controlled. So there are all these potentially confounding factors um, and it's, you know, you're finding correlations, not, you know, causative um, connections. On the flip side, you can do, and researchers have done all sorts of laboratory studies. So like you could put people in a thermal chamber and crank up the temperature and see how that affects their performance on a cognitive test. And researchers have done that too. And they can find that, you know, when the temperature goes up, people's scores on these cognitive uh, uh, tests go down. And so maybe in whether it's an operating room or some other workplace, you wanna make sure it's not too hot. And that's like a perfectly valid conclusion from that study. Um, you know, the advantage is you can exactly control the environment. Um, the disadvantage is though, of course, you know, the world is not a temperature controlled chamber and there are all these other things going on. Um, yeah. So sort of what's sometimes called evidence-based design or data-driven design um, really incorporates a lot of different studies of, of both kinds um, and by sort of piecing the results together you can try to get at mm -hmm. you know what um, the most important factors are um, I mean that said one challenge for 
all this work is, you know, researchers use different methods and study different environments, and it can be hard to sort of synthesize the work. Yeah. Um, but those are sort of the two main approaches that researchers take. And you could you can gather all these data and you have them, but you still have to test conclusions and come up mm -hmm. with ideas. The answers don't just flow out automatically from the data, unfortunately. Right, right. And one thing I, that sort of becomes a theme in the book is also like, it's not, um, you know, perfectly predictable system where like you yeah. change one thing, change the temperature, change the room size, and you get exactly the outcome you want. You know, you can have all these unanticipated effects, positive and negative, you know, humans are really complex, environments are complex. And so it's, it's <laughs> not as simple as like input output. I was I was really interested in the uh, in the operating room study that one of the things that they decided to measure because that's something that you have to decide is how can we measure something that we think we can show is well connected to something we can affect is they measured these things that uh, you and probably they called flow interruptions and you noted that they they did a number of these studies 28 examples you mentioned, but they found 100 flow interruptions on average at each one of these. And these are um, what little incidents like uh, not having the scalpel ready or perhaps dropping something or misplacing something or not be able to find something, anything that, that interrupts that well-timed flow, right? Do you have any idea why how they came to that that's that was a very interesting sort of thing and it's a measurable sort of thing which you have to have you mean how they decided to look at flow disruptions yeah. i yeah. mean that, um that was something that had been written about before and is in the literature in terms of okay. i guess the reason they're interested in that is because there is some work suggesting that there it's correlated with medical errors or serious um adverse outcomes and so the idea is that, you know, some flow disruptions are really extremely minor, like, you know, there's a cart of instruments in the way and so you have to walk around it, you know, like that's not a huge deal. Um, but there is some evidence that suggests that little problems, especially in such a like fast paced and high stakes environment can snowball into bigger problems. And so it's not necessarily that all of these flow disruptions are in and of themselves that bad, but that they could you know, maybe it'll cause a treatment delay or a medication mix up or, mm -hmm. um, so their theory was the more you can reduce these flow disruptions, you can perhaps reduce mm -hmm. adverse outcomes in the OR. And then, then observing uh, these situations and, and taking notes and, and seeing what was going on and then uh, debriefing the people involved in the studies afterwards and things, they, they came to some, really interesting conclusions, design changes, and unexpected things like, didn't anybody ever notice that more, another trash can in the operating room yep. might <clears throat> go more smoothly? <laughs> and, um, I thought that too, when I read that, and the nurses were doing a test run of the new design. And I thought, well, did it occur to them to count how many trash cans there were in the surgery before they redesigned? <laughs> Another trash can would be helpful, but that's I mean, sometimes, yes, you don't notice those things. And then there are unobvious things like not putting the operating table in the middle of the room seem to be a really significant conclusion. Yeah, I mean, and so it's a combination of, I mean, that's, I think, a side effect of how complex these environments are, is even though they, you know, spent hours reviewing tapes of surgeries like there's so much going on that maybe like no one thinks to like make note of the trash cans um and then there are other things that like are just done out of habit like the or table in the center of the room like it's not that they're overturning decades of previous research with this it's just nobody had ever thought to say like huh like what yeah. if we do it differently yeah. um and so that's yeah. that's one way and you know hospitals are some of the earliest places where we've seen this evidence-based design um sort of be implemented but even there there's still so much left to learn at, at, at a different place in the book in, in connection with uh office space which we'll probably discuss you said that uh it's important to note that uh something like 
um, a product a workers a productive workers space is not necessarily the same as a happy mm -hmm. workers space. And it was very interesting too that some changes, I suggested changes to the operating room for things like putting in a window because of the light and the possible views and things don't do much for the patient on the table, but sure make the staff a lot more productive and have a pleasanter time doing this. And that's, I mean, and especially if, you know, if you're doing one of these long operations, that's eight or 10 or 12 hours long, yeah. you can have a surgical team that basically goes in in the morning and doesn't see daylight all day. And we right. know that not just for their happiness, but like, adequate exposure to daylight, especially in the morning, is helpful for alertness. And yes. so like it's, you know, better performance and in theory, happier staff. So, so this was this. I, well, if you don't mind, uh, I was wondering if you I can't remember some places you went and saw. Did mm -hmm. you see this new surgical suite with the windows? So I saw a mock-up of it, which they had built. Um, so th they had like a cutout in the wall where the window would go, but it was this like mock-up they'd built inside um, like a, a design center. So it was inside mm -hmm. another building. Um, so I got to watch a team of nurses go through some simulated surgeries in this mock-up. Interesting. Wow. Uh, sometime in the, what, 80s or 90s, um, there was a switch in uh, hospital design and idea and operating, an idea to be more patient centric for better outcomes and things. And I've lived just long enough and been in the hospital just long enough to have noticed, like the last time that I was there 15 years ago or so, uh, a remarkable change to how the intensive care unit was run, where once upon a time, <clears throat> the best people were only allowed to visit one at a time between the hours of 4.15 and 4.25, uh, <laughs> a strictly recommended uh, day. And this time when I was there, all these things that you discuss in the book and about why they are, you know, the rooms were individual. They were uh, rearranged so they were easily visible to the, to the staff. People, visitors could pretty much come and go any time if I wanted to have visitors at two in the morning, they were fine with visitors at two in the morning, all because of this patient-centric patient uh, approach, right, design. Mm -hmm. And so you discuss that in the chapter and the, uh, oh, I don't have his name handy, who um, did some early studies of how to improve outcomes that led to single hospital rooms that could reduce infections, keep the rooms quieter, be more accommodating to visitors, aid patient doctor uh, co communication. Uh, those, those were big changes and they seem obvious afterwards, but not before. Yeah, I mean, and what's really interesting about that history, I think is in some ways we've gone back to embracing some of the ideas that defined earlier hospital design. Um, so, you know, most viewers have probably heard of Florence Nightingale. Um, they may or may not know that she was really involved in advocating for things in hospitals like ample access to daylight, lots of ventilation and fresh air, um, nature views. And there were not studies at the time quote unquote, proving that those things were good, but she and others just had this intuition. And there were hospitals that were designed this way to be sort of open to the air and the environment and these lush courtyards um, in the 19th century, in the second half of it, especially. Um, but then what happened was, you know, the 20th century came along, we discovered uh, germs and germ theory took off and, oh, we can use chemicals and antiseptics to, you know, keep everyone infection free and technology improved. And so hospitals sort of became these hermetically sealed, closed off machines. And the focus was sort of this factory like model of delivering healthcare. And it sort of took this dual revolution of evidence based design and, as you said, Jeff, uh, you know, patient centered care to realize like, oh, wait a minute, like mm -hmm. maybe just efficiency is not the end all and be all. And there are things we can do for patients. And so what we're seeing now is sort of a return to how can we bring light into all the patient rooms? How can we sort of make these places more humane? 
um, mm -hmm. and not just yeah. like these warehouses. Mm -hmm. and, and I like that what pops up a lot through the whole book is the nature, the a view of nature. So we see, you know, prisons, schools, uh, you know, maybe um, and hospitals that, yeah, a view of nature in some way and the shift in lighting and workers, right? So for some reason that is so crucial, so crucial. Yeah, I mean, I've had people ask like, what are the top things I can do to my space? And like, usually the first or second thing I say is find a way to bring nature in because it just has so many benefits. Um, and the sort of cool thing about it is like, it's great if you can, you know, fill your house with plants or, you know, plant a garden right outside your window. But even if that's not your thing, like there are plenty of studies that suggest that just like having photographs or images of nature around, even like bird song and nature sounds can have some of the same benefits and, and stress reducing effects. Um, so that's like a really easy way, no matter what kind of space you're in to, to try and improve it. I think I'll, I'll tell my boss when I go back to work because my, <laughs> my office has no windows or anything. Uh, whereas when I'm working right here, I have a window, I have natural sunlight and I have a tree right outside and I feel so much calmer. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, that's one of the most consistent findings. They're just study after study. Support. But and and you you see that going on in all these hospitals I've been in now, where they are single rooms where they try to arrange windows uh, so that you see a bit of nature rather than a brick wall. Uh, and it's nice and it was interesting hearing you talk about uh, you know antiseptic uh, period in the early twentieth century. It would be easy to look back and say, well, those people were horrible Nazis who wanted to control everything. <laughs> But you, you give a hint about a different picture where it's like the idea of, of controlling the environment to try to keep it antiseptic, mm -hmm. and clean and pure and things sort of gets out of hand after a while. But, but the motivation started out in a good place because people didn't die of sepsis then if you did that. Oh, and you, you got better patient outcomes. And then do we have, do you think any understanding of, of where this I don't know if it was sudden, but this big change to this this more patient centric approach and outcomes came from. It's not entirely clear. I mean, I think it was a couple of um, it was a couple of factors working together. I mean, I think part of it was you know you start to see in the seventies things like the disability rights mm -hmm. movement and activism and sort of more patients advocating for themselves. Um, and then you, you know, a few decades later, you see the birth of evidence-based medicine, which now to us seems obvious, but it was not, I mean, that was something that was invented and it sort of came about in the early nineties. And that sort of also sprung this idea, sort of sister idea of evidence-based design. And if we're, if everything we're doing inside a hospital should be supported by evidence, maybe the design of the hospital should be as well. Um, but some of the, uh some of that also grew with the enabling technology. You couldn't have done a lot of these 21st century data-driven experiments until you had computers big enough, way to handle a terabyte of data a day and sensors that, that are able to, to do all these things. So they, they grow up together. Right, absolutely. Um, I, I you know, I'm thinking of another technology that, well, interestingly so you started with hospitals and well you started with homes and the things that live with us yeah. that we don't even know they live with us right and actually you know nobody thought to look what do you live with how does that change depending on the family and the person and some of that couldn't happen until we had the genome sequencing technology the metagenomics to just look at everything you know, take a sample and just you know, you can't grow it all, but you can check the genomes and put that, you know, check against the database. So you've got Jack Gilbert, you've got Rob Dunn, and, uh, you know, these people who work on what lives with us. Mm -hmm. And I felt like um, that was that was pretty early in the book, and that was a good way to start. And do you think people should be shocked by what <laughs> lives with us or comforted by what lives with us? Well. Yeah, I mean, I know that. Um, 
and I've already started hearing from readers that were like, I think I liked the first chapter, but I don't know if I liked the first chapter. Um, the first I chapter mean, is. <laughs> the about the indoor microbiome. Yeah, um, just use that word. Yeah, and so um, I mean, I was shocked even going into it, knowing that there was researchers are finding a lot. I was stunned by how much is hidden in our homes. Um, I mean, I think the researchers I talked to explicitly said, and I tried to communicate, like this is stunning, but it's really for the most part, not something to freak out about. Um, I mean, I liked the idea of, of thinking about our homes as ecosystems, just as the outdoor world is. And, you know, there are some disease causing organisms that can live in our homes, but for the yeah. most part, what's there is completely benign. And some of the microbes are even beneficial to our developing immune systems. And so it's really, I mean, researchers do not want us to be, you know, Cloroxing the hell out of our houses. Um, these, this is just sort of a natural part of our indoor world. And um, I understand why some people might be creeped out um, and that's not necessarily like the wrong reaction, but I did try to sort of explain that this is not a bad thing that, I mean, as one researcher told me, like you don't want to have a sterile house. Um, which yeah. is good because none of us have one. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> well, if people are freaked out, we can recommend a uh, good reading on the microbiome that we live with uh, <laughs> right. inside us. Uh, do you want to justify now why why you recommend that uh, your immune system's best friend could be a dog or a cat? I'd like to hear that. <laughs> sure. Um, well, so I to clear, the dog is probably better than a cat. Mm -hmm. um, but so there are a lot of studies now that suggest that children who get exposed to a wide diversity of microbes early on in life develop more robust immune systems and are less likely to develop a variety of um, allergies and autoimmune disorders. Um, and one of the things researchers have discovered is that dogs bring a rich assortment of microbes into the home. Um, and most of these microbes are not sort of damaging or dangerous, but what they do do is they increase a home's microbial diversity. And there have been studies that show that kids that grow up with dogs are less prone to a variety of these ailments. And the theory is it's because in part of all the, the different microbes they get exposed to. Cat, right, cat, cats dog... also do that, but to a slightly less lower extent. Yeah, because your dog goes out and in and out right. and in many times a day. and bringing in soil microbes and then you know the microbes that live in their bodies and um so it's largely behavior with the dogs not so much that dogs travel in a different biome environment than cats do uh well it's not entirely clear i mean the researchers i talked to thought it was probably a couple of things um mm -hmm. the fact that dogs tend to be more likely to go in and out i mean there are some outdoor cats but um, dogs tend to spend more time outside and also their larger body size. Um, I guess in, the in theory, it could also be related to some sort of biological difference between the two. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, I don't know if the studies, so there have been a lot of studies done on dogs and there have been studies that show that dogs change a home's microbial makeup more than cats do. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if the study has been done to look at whether kids who grow up with cats are similarly mm -hmm. protected right. um, from mm -hmm. disease. Um, so that might be something to still do. You know, I was interested in, uh, you. Um, I think it was Jack Gilbert's work in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, when one patient leaves, the, their, their microbiome's left over, like you can see evidence of that person's microbiome in, in the hospital. And then, but when the next person comes in, it doesn't take long until that person's microbiome mm -hmm. takes over. And I was like, wow, you would think you would start seeing a mix or maybe now the new person will start acquiring that other person's microbiome. And I was really interested in that, uh, that aspect. You know, I think it was shocking to them too. Yeah, not, I mean, it's a pretty long rapid long hour, right? I'm sorry? Not long, as Joanne says, it was a few hours or a something. A few hours, yeah. Yeah, so I think like when, when patients first come into the room, they tend to pick up whatever microbes are around them. So like whatever 
has been left on the handrail and stuff like that. But by the time 24 hours have passed, the flow has completely reversed and it's microbes going from the patient to the room. Um, so, yeah. That's really okay. interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, oh, oh, and one more surprising thing was that they could tell within, I, it wasn't very far, but within a few hundred miles where you are from based on the samples. You know, you send in microbiome samples and they go, oh yeah, they live sort of near Atlanta or they, you know, they would live near Colorado or something like it's that regional specificity that, yeah, I was I'm like, what? <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, especially the fungi. Um, a lot of the bacteria that live in our homes tend to be correlated with us and come from us in our body. But it turns out a lot of the fungi are from outdoors and they're like drifting in from outside. And so that means it's really climate dependent. And so that um, allows researchers to sort of narrow down where a sample comes from. Yeah. Parenthetical Back question. Since, yes. You know, since this book we could we could describe, I think, as, as thoroughly data driven itself and you've done a great amount of research there's a lot of very interesting uh, references and such and since you mentioned researchers you talked to do you happen to have statistics on how many people you talk to and how many places you visited <laughs> not off the top of You've my been head very busy with this book. but yeah and i did i mean i interviewed i mean Writers will always say they interview a lot more people than you use, mm -hmm. but I feel mm -hmm. like this is the most extreme, sort of like the lowest percentage, uh, the, the most select selective I've been uh, about, um, uh -huh. you know, um, I, I did, I would say at least twice as many interviews as appear in the book. Um, so maybe a third, a quarter to a third made it. Um, I don't I guess like 100 to 150, Yeah, uh, but I haven't counted. Was that, was that a matter of, of what, keeping things that, that fit, no, I don't want to say fit as though it's predetermined, but that, that supported the, the flow of the, of the book that you were writing, uh, that there's just not room for everything and some things become diversions from a main, a main thread. Yeah, it's some of that and some of, you know, it's an enormous topic and that was my sort of biggest challenge was like figuring out what to leave out. Um, and some of it was just, you know, heartbreaking, like I don't think I'm gonna have time to cover this topic. Yeah. And some of it was just sort of in the normal process of in order to find sort of like the perfect character or project to illustrate mm -hmm. this concept, you yeah. know, you don't necessarily hit that on the first try. So it was talking to a lot of people to figure out like who is the best Person plus, to feature. Plus, as I noted when we were talking earlier, follow ups. You, right. Yeah. You talk to people yeah. later on after uh, things had developed some. Right. And so. some of it is finding people who are game. Like there are some people, and you know, in every story or project who's like, work is fascinating. It seems like they'd be a great person to feature, but like they don't really seem that open to it, or it's like pulling teeth to get their time. And like, knowing that I was going to be coming back to these people again and again, you know, like you don't want to <laughs> force someone into this who doesn't really want to be a part of this because it's a lot of time mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. their part as well. I hope they're happy about that. I, not to recap the entire uh, table of contents <laughs> precisely, but talking about these environments and trying to uh, look and see how design of the environment uh, affects people. The, the topics that you covered in various chapters were, as Joanne said, in the home, there was um, people who were building for uh, autistic people and mm -hmm. other people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. You studied, you looked at prisons, you looked at the hospitals with their operating rooms inside, you looked at uh, schools. schools, particularly yeah. in elementary school and the environment for it. You even looked at space, you looked at mud houses uh, and other things and I don't I feel like I'm leaving out several already it was <laughs> the workplace the workplace the workplace a big yeah. one on the workplace where where we learned that uh, just because you're productive doesn't mean you're comfortable right <laughs> and that some people like it warmer and some people like it cooler but you can still learn things uh, about it that sounded particularly complicated and I was also <clears throat> I think one that well there were a couple that particularly caught my eye I'll come back to the one, but 
uh, prisons did because it seems like there's so much possible room for improvement, plus the fact that it's hard to imagine enough political will to do much improvement <laughs> uh, about some of that. But uh, I don't know, it could be, where did you draw the line for horrible stories uh, about bad prison design and <clears throat> how people were treated and why there might be, and then justifying some cause for why it's to everybody's benefit to make prisons a better place. Well, I don't think I drew the line anywhere when it comes to horrible stories. I mean, I, as you saw, like I interviewed a number of men who had been in solitary confinement in some cases for years, yeah. and I, I didn't have room to tell. I, you know, corresponded with more of them than I could include, so I didn't have room to tell every story. But I wasn't a lim you know, I wanted to relay their real experiences. So I don't think there was anything I left out because it was like too mm. horrible. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a more matter of space and like, you know, the, the reader doesn't need to hear from every single person. are pretty horrible too. Um, but yeah. But I mean, I guess the, the argument for why people should care about prisons is, you know, I have a couple answers to that. Um, I mean, one is just sort of the larger moral issue of like, what kind of society do we want to be and how do we want to treat these vulnerable marginalized people? Um, and for me, that's enough. But if that's not enough, um, there's an economic argument that like our supermax prisons, which are incredibly cruel and inhumane, are also incredibly expensive to run. Um, and some states have actually started shutting them down. And, you know, I think one impetus, one reason that criminal justice reform has become bipartisan is because some people on the more conservative side have realized what, how much money we're spending locking mm -hmm. people up mm -hmm. um, in these incredibly harsh environments. And the, uh, it, and the I'm sorry, but in, in the, in the no, example that you, you talked about, and one of the uh, really good data-driven places where you can show in the outcomes, uh, but you talked about this uh, an incarceration place for women that seemed to some people would be described as a little too country club like but had certain things similar to the hospitals of more nature involvement a bit more of this and uh the way that they were that the uh residences were built uh gave some more freedom of movement while still keeping an eye on people without feeling so intrusive a, a thing that you can measure uh, is not only the outcomes of recidivism and things like that, but the naysayers for this particular place said, you can't put in this nice furniture, they won't take care of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you find out that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a conclusion yet from the data, but when you treat the, the in inmates better, they behave better. Yeah, one of the most interesting um, interviews I did on that was uh, a guy named Richard or Rich Winner, who's really like one of the foremost thinkers on, on prison design. He's been studying it for decades. Um, but he said, you know, one of the things that our environment does is it communicates messages about mm -hmm. what kind of place it is and what people expect of us. Mm -hmm. And so when you go into a prison or a jail that's all concrete, all bars, everything's bolted down to the floor, that communicates like, mm -hmm. we don't, you can't be trusted. We think of you as savages or as animals. And like, we expect you to act accordingly. Whereas when you have actual furniture and, you know, a place that feels more homelike, that sort of communicates that we expect you to take care of yourself and to take care of this place. And, um, you know, the environment can be a really powerful way to set those expectations. Um, and yeah, that must have made an influence because it made enough of influence on me as the reader that I wrote down the right. quote, you quoted him as saying, prison design creates expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, that just seems like suddenly uh, that's a whole motto for many of this is that in all of these cases, there are expectations. Uh, and I actually, I, it's in the same chapter because I thought this was really resonant. Um, there's a study of schools and adolescents and researchers have found that adolescents that go to schools that are better maintained and just sort of more pleasant environments um, 
not only do better academically, but have more belief in their ability to succeed. And her theory is similar, which is that like the environment's communicating, like if it's a nice, well-maintained environment that like this is important and you are important yeah. and you are of value. Right. And when the environment is poorly maintained, it sort of communicates that you are not of value. Um, mm -hmm. So that can be a really powerful signal, I think. Yeah, and uh, you know, speaking of schools and going back to an earlier chapter about schools, um, the, the school was uh, trying to be designed to get people to be more active and healthy and also make better food choices. And so for that reason, they did things like get rid of big freezers that could hold ice cream treats and things like that, or um, think, um, you know, long walks from one place to another. But actually some of these changes weren't readily accepted, right? They were met yeah. with resistance. Yeah, um, and the walks were one of them, um, you know, which is it seems like encouraging walking throughout the school day would seems like a no brainer. Um, but, you know, the teachers obviously have a different perspective on that. And there's, you know, this is a school where the students struggle a lot on the state's standardized tests. Um, it's a high poverty district. And, you know, the teachers are saying every time we have to take a 10 minute walk to get somewhere, like we lose instructional time and we already don't have enough of it. Um, and so it's really, you know, it's a balance between all of these competing demands um, and, and it's difficult. Right. Well, I think of when you talked about these long walks, I always think of the walk from the airplane to the luggage yes. retrieval. <laughs> yeah. It's like, who thought of that? But then I guess it makes you feel like you're waiting less. <laughs> no, that, that is. There have been studies on that. That, yeah. um, that like, I can't remember where it was done, but passenger um, satisfaction rates like soared at this airport after they designed in longer walks because there was less waiting time for their baggage. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would have been, uh, I know your book could, could become very, very huge, but airports would have been a really nice. I thought, of, yeah, that was one of the, <laughs> the sections that ended up having to get the ax, but um, yeah. Well, yeah. That would we were talking about hospitals. My question was, when is, is flying by air going to become customer centric? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So um, I was particularly interested, and maybe Jeff too, but in the chapter for uh, people who are differently abled, autism, uh, hearing impaired, and uh, how to create living spaces for that, or with the flexibility to accommodate mm -hmm. people with these different abilities. And um, Jeff actually works at Gallaudet. He's yeah. not in the in the section that is trying to recreate the well, the different color to contrast the skin you know, and things that like that. Something I was going to bring up. So my contribution before you get to talk for the, for the rest of the show <laughs> about it, is that I work in disability support. Mm -hmm. So we're the you know the ADA office on campus who accommodates students with disabilities. Where at the Gallaudet campus, by the way. Uh, deafness is not accommodated because it's accommodated for everyone, mm -hmm. which has an interesting resonance because a lot of people, a lot of administrative type people will resist accommodations because of cost, trouble and things. And uh, I, I very often end up telling stories again about how accommodation was mostly about physical barriers about 30 years ago for wheelchair users and other visible things like that. And people strongly resisted putting in curb cuts and wheelchair ramps and automatic door openers, which zoom ahead by 30 years, are now universally used, are welcomed by parents pushing strollers, are the first things that we clear of snow on the ramps uh, in the winter because everybody can use the ramp and many people prefer to. And uh, it, honestly, if I see as many as 20% as of students opening a door by pulling on it rather than pressing the button, I would be amazed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was so helpful to have you point out that uh, even in the, the big examples where you, you were talking about people who are designing for people who have autism, that good design for people with autism is also just good design. Good design. Mm -hmm. And one, you know, one of the... Um 
pe people I quote in this chapter says like what we're talking about is she calls them neurological curb cuts. Mm -hmm. So curb cuts are this famous example where they were designed, you know, explicitly for a certain use case, people in wheelchairs, but they made life better for all sorts of people um, in a lot of ways. And so some, something similar, like you know, something that comes up. But, well, I guess I should say first a caveat that like there's no one like design mm -hmm. that's good for autistic people right. the same way right. there's no one design that's good for everyone. There's no yeah. one size fits all. But certain themes and solutions emerge again and again. And one of them, for instance, is soundproofing mm -hmm. because of a lot of autistic people are very sensitive to sensory stimuli. Well, that's something that like I would love to have in my apartment too, yeah. you know, like um, soundproofing and flexibility and like all those things are good for everyone. Um, and so it's not some, you know, quote unquote special use case, but really thinking about how to make environments that work for everyone. Right. So neurotypicals can absorb some of these disruptions, these constant, you know, and maybe autistic people don't always. It depends on the person, of course. Right. So yeah. And it doesn't it doesn't mean that it doesn't bother neurotypicals, just that right. perhaps they can deal with it a little just more absorb easily. Absorb it better, yeah. It's yeah, not. I mean that's the other thing someone said to me was that, you know, someone say with autism might not be able to sort of tolerate some of the quote unquote bad design that the rest of us just accept. And so in some ways they help highlight like the problems in design um, and environments that, yeah. you know, are bad for everyone, but because they're less tolerant of it, might be able to help us figure out how to fix it. Yeah, that, I think that's very, yeah, very highlighting, um, you know, to highlight uh, the flaws in design. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be a beneficial thing for everybody. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Can you see those lessons that, uh, you know, there were these small, uh, smaller examples of, of buildings and things designed for communities like this? Um, and they're special, they're individual instances, but can you see those things flowing into a more general uh, design understanding among architects and other designers and builders and community designers you think the way curb cuts have become almost a normal thing and ramps are just built in i mean i i think we're not anywhere close to that yet but i do think we're starting to see like a number of public amenities and spaces are adding like sort of escape not escape rooms but like uh <laughs> places where yeah. people who are overwhelmed can go. go down, you know, seeing them in museums and sports stadiums and zoos. Um, and you're also seeing like movie theaters have like low sensory stimulation screenings where like they turn the sound down a bit. Um, so I think we are starting to see some of that, you know, I don't think it's, I wouldn't call it widespread yet, um, but yeah. I think it will become more common. Um, Maybe the, the big Oprah question is, did writing this book make you feel more optimistic that that human culture is making progress of some sort? Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah. um, it's hard to separate that from everything else that's going on in the world right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I mean, I do think that we have reason to be optimistic about our ability to change our environments for the good. You know, the question is, do we have the political and social will? Mm -hmm. um, that financial and... Yeah. Right, but like the technical capability is there. Right. If so, we want to take it. So I assume at this point, a lot of people are saying, what an interesting book at this time when mm -hmm. we're all stuck inside. So maybe if you can sort of, um, if you if you want, highlight some of the things that keep coming up again and again, that now that you've written this book and now that we're, inside or maybe now we have to change our workspace so people come every other day or schools every other day have these ideas been floating around your head uh consideration now that you're so well informed about living and working spaces yeah i mean there's there's a lot still to be learned i mean everything that's happening now is pretty unprecedented um right. but there are some like pretty clear lessons um if people have been reading a lot about this, I don't know that I have anything like 
earth shattering to share, but you know, things like ventilation and mm -hmm. how important ventilation is. Um, and interestingly, that's true even in non COVID times as well. Like, I don't think there was, you know, one of the things that's happened, not just in hospitals, but like in commercial buildings and office buildings over the 20th century, is our buildings got really sealed up. And mm -hmm. it was for a good reason in theory, um, you know, for energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, but as a result, often we have, we just recirculate the same indoor air. And not only is that not great from an infectious disease perspective, but that's not great from a perspective of indoor air pollution, which scientists yeah. are learning is a major source of our exposure to air pollutants happens in buildings. Um, and so I think there was already slowly, um, a dawning realization that we needed to figure out a way to get more fresh air into our buildings um, from a pollutant perspective. Mm -hmm. And COVID just really highlights that and makes it more urgent. Um, you know, even things like a lot of office buildings don't even have operable windows anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. like something as simple as making sure that windows can be opened. Pop open um, a window, yeah. <laughs> it's really important. Still you know. newer office buildings, though, sometimes do now. Oh, yeah. I, think, I think it's been that realization that that was something that went too far. Mm -hmm. At the very, very end of the book, and uh, before you got to uh, space environments, but you were talking about uh, building for older people. And I have to be careful because I'm an elderly person now. <laughs> building for older people. Uh, and the idea, looking at all these people who are excited to be looking at ideas of what smart sensors can do and can looking in the mirror, which can read, I don't know, the color of your teeth, tell that you're about to have a stroke and various really pretty amazing things. And the question always then is, uh, just because we can do it, should we be doing it? And so I want to reflect on your quotation from nearly page 200, where you said, I also wonder about the social consequences of outsourcing more and more tasks to ever smarter machines. And that's sort of a, a big a big concern of the century, isn't it? Yeah. And it's some this is a I hadn't thought about it till right now, but um that sort of piece echoes, I think, my big takeaway from Frankenstein's cat, which for people who don't know was all about animal biotechnology. Yeah. And um the argument I made there and that I would make in this case of, you know, so I'm focusing on like smart home technology that can monitor our health is that the technology itself is sort of value neutral um, and that there are ways we can use it for good and there are ways we can use it for ill. Um, and, you know, we have the power to make those decisions. And so, like, I don't think it's necessarily bad that we now have, you know, mm -hmm. software that can detect when an elderly person falls in their home. But if we use that to replace like visits from their children mm -hmm. or from caregivers or to say, oh, they don't need an in-home health aid because they have fall detection software. Yeah, like, nice. you know, that is not what I would want to happen. Um, so this technology is great, but then comes the hard part of thinking through like, how do we use it in a humane way and in a way that's helping and not hurting? No. Right, and, and then the whole hacker issue, et cetera. Right, right. Yeah, even and, before um, you get to that, yeah, but. Yeah, and the, you know, I even think of like the workplace monitoring and how that, you know, employers could know a little too much about you. you yeah. Know, and, and you said against you. <laughs> Right. And that's something that I think a lot of people are thinking about right now is where places reopen, you know, like you are talking about temperature checks and some companies are even going as far as to monitor workers movements in theory for a good, you know, so they can, if someone tests positive, they can say, oh, you had contact with these other employees, but like, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to think about how that could go really wrong really fast experience says that once we have data in order to mm -hmm. look at good things other people will surely find ways to exploit it for reasons that were not originally intended and may not necessarily be beneficial well and that's the the other thing that's interesting is that you know knock on wood the pandemic will eventually go away but like if we open ourselves up to and allow all this you know if we allow our workplace to have all this access to health information about us in this highly unusual situation, 
yeah. will that just become the norm? Like, mm -hmm. will, will it, how easy will it be to pull back when this threat is gone? I'm not sure it will be that easy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Employers may resist, right? They go, oh, right. It could be really and, beneficial. And also if worker, you know, em employees might not, um, complain that much if they you know they've gotten used to it they sort of signed their consent away when it seemed important and now it's just you know part of the background oh, yikes yeah yeah well, that, that's happy <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you know actually there was one the most surprising thing in the book to me i didn't know about was amphibian housing <laughs> and we're not talking about a house that keeps frogs and salamanders we're talking about a house <laughs> that can withstand flooding in this time of climate change. I I just, I was like, oh, why haven't I heard of this before? So it's really, really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting ideas out there um, about sort of disaster proof homes. Um, and a lot of them are still pretty niche. And I'm not convinced that a lot of mm -hmm. them are ever going to become widespread. But it is, I think, uh, you know, something that designers are thinking more and more about is like the future is going to be pretty turbulent and how can we create sort of resilience has used to hear a lot about sustainability and you still do but now the idea of sort of resilience has almost replaced that um, a lot of these ideas get developed as responses and most of them aren't going to be practical everybody's not going to be building a geodesic dome and right. yet and yet things that we learn from the fact that those have been invented, they feed into uh, I don't know, the idea stream and get get digested and taken up and and they contribute to the, the direction that things flow in the future. Yeah. Really. Uh, I don't know. Do you, so do you have something optimistic that you want to <laughs> leave us leave us with as we Well, I mean, I guess this is sort of where I leave the book too, but I think the optimistic part or part is that we now have a lot of data. There's still a lot to learn, but we yeah. know a lot about what makes good humane environments. And so like, you know, we will continue to build houses and offices and schools and all sorts of buildings. And we now have the knowledge to create much more humane buildings, healthier buildings, we know enough that we can do that now. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's, you know, and, and actually a lot of um, a lot of designers and architects are interested in those ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, like I talked to firms that like run the well building certification program and like there's a huge interest and appetite in that from the public and, um, you know, from designers themselves. And so, you know, the question is always and I have some examples in the book of like, Things don't always work out as you mm -hmm. plan, uh, but there are a lot of people who want to start doing things differently. And all of those people who do this. Oh, as promised. Oh yes. yeah, I, we almost <laughs> made it without a siren, but no That's good. But all those people do read things and they're interested in these ideas and they hear them and it, it does influence their work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think see then. And, and you're seeing just, um, you know, growing organizations like Designers for Justice and Architects for Justice and Social okay. Responsibility. And like, I think a lot of designers are now at least interested in exploring and thinking through, and I don't mean to suggest this is new, there have always been designers, but like, I think a growing interest in thinking through like the social economic ramifications of what we build. Right. right new influences. New, yeah. New, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, I'm curious. It took a long time uh, between one book and the next because you mm -hmm. did a lot of research. Do you have an idea for another yeah. another book? Uh, I do. Um, it's a secret. <laughs> it's not secret. I don't know. I have one leading contender. I'm not sure I'm going to pursue it yet. Um, I guess what I will say is it would take me back into the animal world a bit, um, nice. which is the um, territory of my first book. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's sort of the leading contender right now, but I, I'm i gonna go back to like sh freelancing shorter pieces for a while just as a break and sort of think things through, but um, right. I am hoping but, to do And maybe book. traveling now is 
<laughs> yeah. Lower on the uh, scale yeah, of things we should be doing. True. So. So, but hopefully I'll be back here in another six or seven years to yeah, <laughs> talk about the next one. But we'll, we'll keep reading books, so. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll... faster than six or seven years, but we'll see. Well, well these are these are yeah. interesting times, so who knows, yeah. you know. Jo and, oh, I'm gonna ask Joanne the usual question at the end. It's like, is there anything that we forgot to ask or something yeah, you wanted to yeah. say here? Uh, You're asking me? Yes, yes. yes. No, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think we did a pretty good survey of right. a lot of stuff, so nothing comes to mind. Right. Yeah, I enjoyed this book. I felt like it was informative. It was fun. It was, you know, I think data-driven, data -driven, <laughs> nothing too uh, heavy. Uh, the book I read before this was uh, The New Jim Crow. So oh. <laughs> when you spoke about the prisons, I felt like I had a good connection. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was great. We're to talk so to. glad you came. And uh, everybody, thank you for joining us as we spoke to Emily about her her newest book. I'll pull the cover up again, The Great Indoors, uh, about the built environment and how it affects our health. So, Emily, thank you so much. I hope you're staying safe and healthy. And, uh, yeah, it's wonderful to, to have you here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. See you next time.